the Honourable Chief Justice, the members of the judiciary, I understand the DPP is here, DPP, uh, permanent secretaries, uh, members of the legal fraternity, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much uh, for attending the conference. We uh, understand that many, we received uh, enormous feedback, positive feedback, I should say, in respect to the topics that were discussed. And as per tradition, uh, at the end of the, of the convention I, or conference, I'll just do a quick summary and essentially try and pivot all the matters that we discussed as to why we had them as topics, as discussions, and indeed your ability to contribute uh, to the development of law, uh, development of jurisprudence in Fiji. Essentially what we've seen in the past number of years, the AGES conference is about looking at new areas of the law, uh, looking at developing ideas that could come within the legal profession, but overall in the, uh, the legal system itself, and how we as practitioners, as lawyers, as people who are interested in the law can actually contribute uh, to the development of the law in Fiji and, in this, uh, in, and indeed address existing gaps, existing um, uh, matters that need to be addressed, in particular taking into account the fast rate of development, not just as a country physically I'm talking about, in, but in, in respect of new issues that are popping up and which has in fact been largely affected by the advent of technology and the access of technology. So in the, in the first subject that you talked about, about the rights of children, uh, we have seen uh, substantial changes taking place in that area, for example, in respect of technology. There are now child pornographic sites available. Uh, if you go into the black or the, the, the black internet side of things, uh, you actually can go in and pay and watch children being raped. Um, there's uh, enormous levels of information regarding that available. You may not necessarily get to see the pornographic sites, but you actually have information regarding that. Ten years ago, that was not an issue, even in Fiji. Uh, we had, of course, one of the famous cases, the, the pedophile case. I remember when I was in the DPP's office, uh, that case had started when I had already joined, where a, uh, an expatriate who lived near a squatter area uh, befriended the families there and of course befriended the children and uh, started taking photographs of them. Um, you know, in Fiji people still had that mindset that uh, if you were somebody from Australia and New Zealand uh, you'd be safe, a uh, person to send your children to and you know perhaps enjoy the, 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 the benefits of somebody who is quite wealthy, uh, somebody who had you know a bathtub uh, somebody where you could watch videos or DVDs in their home. And slowly but surely he, had, he ended up having sex with his children. But uh, what he also did was ended up uh, photographing or video recording it. Um, he had a twin brother, of course, and then they used to play these games and the children did not know what was happening. And that was one of the cases that actually came up, uh, into the, uh, was brought to the courts. He was successfully prosecuted, but the law actually was quite lacking in the sense that perhaps he should have been sent away for a longer period. And as you know, previously, uh, corroboration was required in sexual assaults. You actually had to prove, for example, uh, penetration by a penis into the vagina. That's how crude it was. Um, and of course, the old Victorian principle that when a woman says no, she actually means yes. So that's why you had the additional grounds of corroboration. All of that, of course, led to us, uh, when we were in government, to completely overhaul the Crimes Act. Uh, I mean, con completely overhaul the Penal Code, as it was called then, and, and we formed the Crimes Act. And of course, there is a more broader uh, definition of sexual assault, uh, which you can see now, uh, the DPP's office and the police, um, you know, getting more cases uh, uh, through, through prosecution, etc. So it's important for us to understand where we were in where we've come to, but also the quick pace of technology. Uh, we also have, you know, linked to that now, um, you know, different smart technologies that's available where you can put people's faces on different bodies. Um, we've set up the Online Safety Commission, and in our opinion, the commission can do a lot better work, uh, and we hope to appoint a permanent commissioner uh, in, in, in time to come very soon. So, so a number of issues have, of course, emanated from that. Uh, children now, of course, have access to uh, technology themselves. 
we've recently found um, that children themselves can become perpetrators uh, of crimes against other children, and I think that was raised uh, by Justice Temo in, in that relation. Um, but, you know, it's not necessarily an easy area to deal with. There are many issues pertaining to values that we teach our children, uh, what values they are taught, for example, in schools, and what and how we actually treat children. From, from, a, from an executive perspective, uh, one of the things that we did do was uh, a couple of years back, we worked together with UNICEF to identify the gaps in the law uh, to be able to be compliant with various international conventions. Fiji now, of course, has ratified the nine core key conventions, uh, which, of course, uh, we must adhere to. And indeed, the constitutional provisions says that in uh, interpreting law, uh, should there be any uh, lacuna, or not lacuna, but should there be any gaps, or indeed you can reference uh, international convention or international standards pertaining to human rights. So I think it's, it's critically important for us to know what the real issues were behind that. What we're trying to do is trying to also get the judiciary to understand and also the legal practitioners to understand that it is not a, a simple matter. It requires collaboration uh, from the practitioners themselves. And that collaboration is critically important. And uh, the Honorable Chief Justice, I'm sure, uh, would be open to suggestions from legal practitioners if they made various submissions as to how they themselves, the judiciary, can improve uh, the, the system, so to speak, to be able to uh, engender a lot more rights for children. But it's not just simply a question of rights, but it's also a question of how we can make the, the process um, less cumbersome, how we can make it more friendly, so to speak, where victims or indeed perpetrators are able to feel comfortable for, us to legal, for the legal process to be carried out a lot more simply and in a lot more sort of uh, efficient manner, but ensure that justice is not denied to anybody. Um, I think somebody had raised oh, how do you deal with children who are uh, intellectually disabled, and that is not necessarily, again, an easy area to deal with. Uh, you know, what, what mechanism they are in place within the judiciary. Fiji uh, lacks substantially uh, a good number. We don't have many counselors. You know, uh, parents generally tell the children, they put their hand on the shoulder, we'd like you to be a lawyer, a doctor, engineer. Uh, I don't think many parents in Fiji say, look, you, my child has got a very high level of emotional intelligence, and I think that this person will actually be a good counselor. They don't necessarily see it as a career path. So even in schools, we actually lack counselors because nobody wants to become a counselor. I'm sure many of you experienced that your teachers doubled up as counselors. So we, in fact, have scholarships for people to become counselors. And until and unless, uh, until and unless we as a society put value uh, on counselors uh, and see that as a profession that's critically important in terms of running a modern nation state, in terms of ensuring that we have rights guaranteed for, the, you know, for those on the margins of society, those who are vulnerable, um, then we won't be actually able to provide that entire sort of gambit of services that's required to be able to address those issues. Lawyers most certainly cannot become counselors, and please don't try and do that unless you've got some form of training. Because many lawyers, for example, have a different mindset. So I think, you know, the, the point of doing this was this session was that, that you can work with the judiciary, and the judiciary can work with the practitioners uh, to be able to address this particular matter. It's, of course, a highly... Um, you know, emotive issue. Uh, and politicians or members of parliament uh, can only do so much. Uh, it's not a political issue. Actually, it's, a, it's a more of a social uh, issue. It's an emotive issue. It also can be, you know, uh, an, a medical issue. I remember going once to a halfway house that government was running uh, in the in domain uh, where this uh, young lady uh, she could hardly speak, but she had this habit of eating her hair. There's a particular condition. She used to pull her hair out and eat her hair. Um, the reason why she was doing that was because she was, uh, you know, being raped, sexually assaulted from a very early age. And her stress, the only way that she could deal with her stress was that that's what she did. So it was in a way a uh, sort of act of punishing herself but also at the same time being able to deal with the stress that she was going through. Somebody was very, in fact, it was the, 
the, the father who was constantly raping her and you know she would wait for him in the night to come and rape him and that's the way she would deal with it and she her cognitive skill sets actually was not very highly developed as a result of the trauma so you know those are the kind of issues that we have to deal with and how do we actually frame the law how do we actually frame the processes and procedures that relates to the the justice system um, that we need to deal with. So I hope you know you were able to. I hope it inspires you. The whole issue, idea behind all this, for you to get inspired as to how you can possibly contribute, as opposed to you going back after this into your little jobs or big jobs and medium-sized jobs or big-sized firms or small-sized firms. But as legal practitioners, what you can do uh, to contribute to the development and indeed uh, protecting people like this. The um, the financial. Uh, the uh, services uh, transactions through digital uh, space or using technology. Uh, of course, it's, you know, it's taken off. Um, many of you do internet banking now. Um, it's seen for many businesses. Is that, that's the way you do business now. Um, there are issues, and I can relate to you some um, um, practical challenges that we have had also. As you know, that uh, we rolled out about $432 million of unemployment benefit, of which about in excess of $200 million was paid out, you know, to the two rounds of 360 and the two rounds of 50 and $90. Nobody actually had to go and queue up outside any office or fill out a form. They simply made the application on the phone, sitting in the comfort of their home, and they were paid out on the phone. So you had in excess of $200 million being paid out through the mobile phone. Now, that was never possible before. There are two reasons why, of course. Uh, one of them is now there's a lot more connectivity throughout. There's only about 5% of the population that is not connected. And the other is that obviously everybody has a mobile phone. Uh, many people don't understand that in 2007, the unit cost of a call on a phone in Fiji was about 99 cents a unit. Uh, today, it's about 23 cents a unit in peak period. You never had five up, seven up, free talk time and all of that. This is why everybody's now on TikTok and Facebook and. Instagram because actually it, the cost is quite, you know, attractive. Uh, in fact, some studies show that we are the third, third cheapest in terms of access to, to, to data services. I think we are behind Israel and Moldova, I think is the other country. Am I correct, Paul, Moldova? I think it's, sorry? Kazakhstan, Israel, Kazakhstan, and Fiji. So, I mean, these are the, the sort of technological advancements that have taken place. Recently, when we rolled out the inflation mitigation, a dollar a day per child, uh, we had some people who said, I typed in the wrong phone number on which you can send my M-Pesa. And the money has gone to somebody else, of course. So how do you retrieve those funds? So somebody's received the funds. So there's perhaps not much regulation around that. So that's the idea of, so again, raising this topic. We need to look at regulations. Many countries, whilst they've adopted in a very advanced fashion, um, you know, the use of fintech, etc., but they don't necessarily have all the regulations. Um, it depends also on the society where people are more forthcoming, perhaps, to say, look, I received this 360 or $180. It's not mine. I want to return it. And they'll go back to the service provider and say, I want to return this money. It's not mine. Perhaps in other societies, they will just keep it. Uh, so, you know, there's need for regulation in, the, in that respect. One important point that we also wanted to highlight, because in respect of cybercrime, is uh, we have been working for the past couple of years, the Ministry of Communications, on working on ratification of the Budapest Convention. The Budapest Convention is to do with cyber uh, criminal acts. And uh, we've had a number of trainings, uh, both for the judiciary and also the police force and various other agencies. And in the last session of Parliament, we presented the Budapest Convention uh, for reference to the, the Standing Committee. So whenever we have to ratify any international convention, by law we have to submit it to Parliament and it has to be sent to the committee. And once the committee has gone through it, they call for submissions, then they have to return it to Parliament within 30 days, within, you know, within the sitting days anyway. So that particular Budapest Convention is on the floor of Parliament. Parliament, of course, has now been prorogued. In the next session of Parliament, that would be revived. So Budapest Convention actually deals with cross-jurisdictional transactions and matters, and in terms of also prosecution. So that we have huge assistance to us uh, with the ratification of Budapest Convention, and also protect us uh, you know, from cyber criminal attacks, etc. We've had uh, 
uh, our ITC uh, services went down for I think three, four days. Vanuatu has been attacked. Uh, Vanuatu entire governmental system is down. They're paying people through checks now uh, as we speak because uh, there has been a attack by this group. Um, and of course now there's the ransom. They, they require governments and some governments actually have paid money. They shut your system down and then they say, you pay us X number of million dollars and only then we'll put it back up. So if you don't have the capacity, if you don't have the legal provisions, if you don't have the, your ratification of international conventions, you become far more vulnerable in, in that respect. So that's one of the things that we are trying to do is both sort of stop attacks from across or beyond the borders, but also internally people can take advantage of that. And I think it'd be very good to hear your views on, on, on that. The National Payment System, uh, of course, there's an Act, National Payment System Act 2021. That was passed by Parliament last year, about, I think, after two or three years of public consultations, etc., and it will soon be put in place. So that allows for a lot of, you know, financial transactions across banks, including your Vodafones, your Digicels, and including large pay, uh, payers of funds, for example, TLTB, that does uh, do, you know, payments to landowners, individual landowners, they get paid money now. So the national payment system actually provides a legal framework within which these transactions can take place and makes it a lot more easier uh, for people who want to use these services uh, to be able to access those services within the framework of the independent RBF. Um, the, um, the next topic was about the mental health issues uh, pertaining to lawyers. I think um, there's some statistics given that uh, there's a 10% suicide rate in USA of lawyers. Um, I, I don't think that's the case in Fiji. I don't think many of you would agree that I don't think there are many lawyers who commit suicide in Fiji. Uh, but it does not mean that they don't necessarily have any mental stress issues. Uh, of course there is. Uh, we ourselves have sort of seen that. Uh, the drafters at the AG's office will tell you they're very mentally stressed before the budget is delivered. Uh, because they have to draft all these amendments to the laws. They work, sometimes they work 48 hours straight uh, without sleeping. Um, and of course, this is a plug for them and a recognition for them. But, but I think, uh, you know, from, from, from the analysis that we have sort of seen or done, there, there seems to be, as opposed to toxicity at workplace, and it can be, I mean, those of you who are managing large, um, you know, uh, legal firms or institutions like FICAC or DPP or Legal Aid, Commission, I mean, Legal Aid Commission is, is, the, is very large. I think it's got about 40 lawyers. It's the largest law firm in Fiji. Uh, there could, of course, be workplace toxicity. There could be competition. Uh, there could be, you know, issues for, pertaining to transfers. There could be, you know, challenges in respect of, uh, uh, you know, competition within the, uh, within the lawyers themselves. And it's up to the management as to how they deal with it. And I think that's something that the, 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 those who run law firms, I mean, even if you may be a, the sole practitioner and you may have some, you know, uh, people working for you as lawyers, even if there are three or four of you, uh, you need to be able to manage that. But the point that I want to make, I've seen a lot of toxicity between law firms, uh, between lawyers from different law firms. I've seen a lot of toxicity where a lot of senior lawyers try and pull out their seniority sometimes when they're intellectually challenged by juniors. And I've seen that on the rise, uh, in fact, and some of you have in fact mentioned to me personally yourselves, how people try and say, well, I've been practicing for the past 20 years and you've only been practicing for 10 years, and therefore my views will hold sway. Well, not necessarily. Uh, in the same way, when we have people applying for jobs, it should go to the best person. Um, so I think that's something that as a profession we need to be able to deal with. Uh, we cannot sort of simply pull out this seniority uh, plug, so to speak, on, on junior lawyers if the junior lawyers themselves actually have something very worthwhile to contribute. Uh, they are not in any way intellectually less than anybody else. So the only thing that they have over the, se uh, the senior lawyers have over them uh, would be perhaps experience. Yes, that's the case. Uh, but what kind of experience, I would question. And secondly, you know, it does not necessarily mean that they always have the right answers. Uh, we have seen a changing society, as I mentioned earlier on, and those who are able to adapt uh, to changing circumstances, those who are able to understand, for
for example, how our society works and how our society is evolving, how we need to keep in institutions independent, how there needs to be respect uh, for independent institutions as opposed to politicizing independent institutions, how we need to actually respect the judiciary, how we need to respect the other independent institutions like the DPP's office or Supervisor of Elections office or FICAC. So I think it's, uh, it, there's, there's, there needs to be, I think, a rethink in the way we deal as, uh, as professions or as a professional group. How do we deal with these sort of, uh, you know, new challenges? And we need to ensure that that the, the younger lawyers, so to speak, are also given a fair play. I mean, majority of you here, over here, I know in Fiji, a lot of people, once they do their two or three year term, they like to open up their own law firm. And that seems to be the, the general scheme of play. A lot of people want to open their own law firm. And as I mentioned to one of the um, uh, persons who recently, I think, I understand, opened a law firm, I said, so what area do you specialize in? Because the legal profession in Fiji does need to have some level of specialization. Everybody who opens a law firm wants to practice every aspect of the law. And you can be, as some people have said sometimes, you know, you can be a jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, and I think that's critically important uh, to be able to understand what is your passion. You need to practice law in a particular area. And you could have your core passion area of the law, and you could maybe have other supplementary areas of the law that could supplement your income. Uh, but you need to be practicing in an area where, you, where you're passionate about that. And that would make you damn good at it. The other point, of course, is that the use of technology Again, it sort of goes back. Many, even the smaller law firms, I mean, I see this all the time because, you know, for the approval of trust accounts, it comes to our office. There are many accounting, new firms are opening up all the time. But at the same time, we get a lot of applications by law firms saying, I, can, I, can you expand the trust account period within which I can give my audit report? We sometimes do this and give extensions to people like three times. So it goes to show a lot of the times that they do not necessarily have the technology in the law firms, that the, the compliance seems to be the sort of last thing that they think about. The focus seems to be on just running the practice. So if you want to run a law firm, uh, please see what area you want to focus in. Please use technology. Uh, you can also get more clients that way. 70% of the population is below the age of 40. 65% of the population is below the age of 35 they are your main client that you'll be addressing. If they are into technology themselves, why should a law firm not be into technology themselves? That's critically important. You, of course, have now the ability through the Legal Practitioners Act to be able to do a lot more as a profession, also in terms of being able to market yourselves as opposed to what you, know, you weren't allowed to do previously. So that would be you know, my uh, uh, sort of suggestion in that respect. We, we need to move away this sort of stratification in the legal profession. We had a submission from the Law Society some last year, I think the year before last. They wanted to, uh, they said to us, uh, verbally did the presentation, saying, we do not want anybody to open up a law firm for the first five years of the profession, uh, because they wanted the time period to be expended. Uh, we said, no, we can't simply rely on that submission. We want to hear from everybody else. All the other practitioners, what do they think of that? And what is the rationale behind having that five-year period as opposed to the existing three-year period? So those are the kind of things. And you know, I, I hope that this can eke out and get you to contribute uh, to these areas. There are numerous areas. And what we do find lacking is when we do open up uh, these areas for suggestions and topics, we find very little suggestions. Uh, people, I think there seems to be a culture of, of not being positively engaged. But, uh, but being negatively engaged, as opposed to sort of commenting on things when it's done, as opposed to making contributions before it is done. The, the other point that I also wanted to uh, make was uh, in respect of perma crisis. Um, you know, the, we had three very good speakers uh, who talked about perma crisis. And I think a lot of people do not necessarily um, understand the extent of which, uh, for example, COVID had an impact uh, on the economy. It had an impact, indeed, posed challenges for conventional methods uh, regarding, for example, workplace arrangements. I mean, things like forewongs weren't there necessarily. People now now working from home. There are lawyers working from home. There are people who work in banks who are working from home. 
So what happens, for example, if I get injured and somebody asks me, well, you know, if I'm working uh, for a bank at home and I, you know, sort of walk from my bedroom while I'm on the computer and I walk to the bathroom and I slip and fall, I'm actively engaged by my employer, so shouldn't I get workers' compensation if I snap my knee? Because if I had fallen in the bathroom at workplace, I would have been compensated. I mean, these are the issues that, that come up. Uh, and these are because of the changes that are taking place in society. Uh, you know, for example, uh, access to, to internet services. If I'm working from home and somebody gets into my sort of, you know, internet, my Wi-Fi area and be, is able to access data, who's going to be culpable for that? Will I, as an employee, uh, be held culpable by my employer to say, you do not have a secure line? and you've actually led to this information that's been leaked out to third or fourth parties. Who is then culpable for that? So a number of those kind of issues are coming up, and we, know we, need, to, we need to think about this. I think the other, the other point is that from PERMA crisis, uh, we've seen the world is extremely you know, uh, unstable. Uh, you've got uh, the, the war in, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, you've got some missiles, I think, last week sort of landed in Poland, and everybody's sort of flexing their muscles. You know, as I was saying to somebody we're having a conversation, the First and the Second World War actually started in Europe. Um, and so God knows whether it's going to extend to other countries or not. Nobody knows when it's going to end. But in the meantime, as a small island developing state, we have to deal with the situation. So whilst we're not in the war, whilst we are not sending troops there, we are actually being economically assaulted by the particular crisis that's happening in Europe. So I'm sure the, the speakers did talk to you about how the price of goods have, you know, uh, increased tremendously on the back of a, a pandemic where the cost of freight has increased significantly. I don't know if they talked to you about freight, but for example, a container before COVID from Auckland to Suva used to cost $5,000. Today, the same container costs $15,500, at least. The holding time at Auckland Airport, uh, Auckland's report is about six or seven days. The Kiwis still haven't got that right yet. Uh, and many other countries actually have those problems. We have many issues, for example, pertaining to you know, bags being held up at airports so if you're transiting through a particular place and the bags arrive six, seven days later. These are new challenges. So how do we deal with that? And how do we, or how flexible or agile should we be to those changes in society? Uh, and that's critically important because sometimes, for example, the very issue, I mean, there's one topic I was going to talk about, but I know it's before the, before the court, so I won't mention that. But you, you need to be able to respond to those changes really quickly, and sometimes those changes or those responses aren't necessarily only sort of economic policies, but as you know, economic policies sometimes require legislative changes. And when you have legislative changes, it, it may actually affect certain standard procedures. It may affect some people's rights. But then there is, of course, a deliberation between the rights of a small group of people over, over the, the, the rights of the national, national good or the national interest. So these are, of course, not easy issues. They need to be dealt with. In the, in the same way, you know, we need to be able to ensure that whilst all of this is happening, the legal profession is running a particular standard. The judiciary is not actually being assaulted. The judiciary, of course, has to deal with new issues whether it's to deal with cases pertaining to curfew. These are all new matters that need to be dealt with by the judiciary. And the judiciary equally needs to be responsive. The judiciary cannot be caught in a time warp. All of us cannot be caught in a time warp. And how quickly we respond to that uh, is, is significantly impo important. Um, I think in all of this uh, with the PERMA crisis is that we need to ensure the independence of independent institutions. We need to also ensure that we zealously guard the independence of those institutions. Because when you have a situation like a perma crisis, when you're changing circumstances overnight, people can fall back on those independent institutions. People can also rely, for example, on the sanctity, if you like, of the judiciary. People can rely, for example, on the independence of prosecutorial agencies. People can rely, for example, on institutions, whether it's Ministry of Employment and other agencies that have to deal with these matters in a very quick manner. The, the, the last point I was make, you know, in terms of, of course, uh, the, the submissions. The, 
I don't necessarily much to say, but I, uh, the point that I wanted to make was that I've seen various submissions by various parties when the AG's office has been taken you know, to, to the court or whether there's some claim against the government or some governmental agency or ministry or likewise when we actually institute certain proceeding, uh, procedures. There needs to be intellectual honesty in your submissions. As an officer of the court, you have actually a case to make. Please, don't hide cases, and I, I assume that people have mentioned that. Don't hide cases because you simply think it's gonna go against you. You need to take it head on, and you need to be able to say that, look, whilst this particular case law is indicating this, or there's a particular ratio in this, my argument is X, Y, Z, and this is my other case law to, in fact, rebut that particular proposition in that case. That is critically important to do because there's a lack of uh, intellectual honesty. And we see that quite a lot. In that, indeed, in terms of hiding facts, we should not do that because we have a responsibility to the court to ensure that we present all the facts, we present all the case law. And it may require not necessarily being overly verbose. You don't have to write a 100-page submission, but you need to be able to take, take all that on, and that's where you know, being erudite comes into play. You need to be erudite about what you're thinking. I was once told when I was becoming a lawyer was that you need to spend a senior practitioner in Australia told me, if you're going to write something, please spend 80% of the time thinking about what you're going to write and 20% of the time writing, as opposed to writing simply whatever comes into your mind. So there needs to be a plan in respect of your arguments. There needs to be a logical flow in terms of what you're going to say. And I think the courts would appreciate the fact that if you're going to be intellectually honest. It brings me to my other point. We have seen so many cases in Fiji now where the lawyers, and we get so many complaints about this, and I'm sure the LPU does get complaints about it. We get individually people writing to us complaining that my lawyer has led me on. When right on the face of it, you know that the, the, the position taken by your client is actually indefensible. I'm not only talking about criminal matters. It's indefensible. That you know that this person does not have a good argument or does not have a case, and it should be settled. Yet many lawyers will continue to take, take money from their clients, give them false hope, drag the matter out through the system. It's a huge burden on the judicial system. It's a huge emotional burden on your client because you're simply dragging them along. And, the, and they, they live with the hope that my lawyer has told me that this can happen and therefore, you know, this will get resolved and something will come in my favor. You need to have the intellectual honesty. You need to have the ethical and moral standard to be able to say, look, you don't actually have a good case. At best, maybe we can get you a settlement. At best, we can sell for, you know, 10 or 20 percent. Oh, look, sorry, this cannot be done. I think it's more morally repugnant for lawyers to lead their clients on when you yourself know, as a professional, that there is no hope in hell that they will get a positive outcome. We get lots of complaints about that. They've taken $3,000, they've taken $5,000, now they want another $10,000, and they'll get me an adjournment, they'll get me a hearing next year. It is very repugnant to do that. And I think you will, as an individual, increase your value, not just an individual, but as a profession, where people will appreciate the fact that this lawyer that I went to has given me the right advice. She has told me that I won't be successful, and these are the reasons why, and therefore we should end the matter. Or to say, look, I can only do X, Y, Z, and that's the limitation. So please, I think you know, that's the, the basis on which you know, we wanted to have, have this discussion. I think the, the other point that is critically important is the development of jurisprudence. I've said this so many times uh, previously, Lawyers in Fiji, not all, some, still are beholden to the precedent that's already been set. As I said, this is the 21st century. You have things like the perma crisis. You have things like technology, access to pornography. Whatever the case may be, the world has rapidly moved on. Rapidly moved on. In the same way the law needs to get up to pace with the changing circumstances, which will require sometimes setting new law. I've always lamented the fact that in the 2013 Constitution, there's an entire array 
entire array of socioeconomic rights. Yet we have not seen those socioeconomic rights being implemented through cases because lawyers are not willing to take up those cases. And there's fantastic jurisprudence available offshore. You can create new jurisprudence in Fiji. And I think, you know, as a, as a profession, that would be a wonderful thing to do. You're actually setting new law. The judges need to get up to speed with respect with many socioeconomic rights. And we've seen, for example, many cases, whether it's cases of Subramani from South Africa and various other cases, uh, the Lovelace case from uh, Canada, where they've actually broken new ground in terms of implementing not only socioeconomic rights, but uh, you know, civil and political rights. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your, for your contribution and your participation at this conference. Uh, we have not had this conference uh, in this uh, particular location. As you know, we've always been beholden to uh, Natandola. Uh, but the good thing is that both of these uh, hotels are owned by FNPF. So you're all contributing to your own so, uh, your FNPF accounts. Uh, the money is going there. Um, we've, uh, we'd like to also thank all those participants, uh, those who uh, you know, participate via Zoom and those who are physically present. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the members of the judiciary who have taken time to be here, including the Honorable Chief Justice uh, and everybody's work behind the scenes.